in uh, 2020, let's do this, 3-1, 3 one, three, one 20. So March 1st, 20 versus March 1st, 22. I'm going to show you something about this. The Lord woke me up in February, February 13th to be exact, 2020. And he gave me these words, sinister plot. Sinister plot. Now, when you hear that, you know, Sinister is a really strong term and a strong word. So I asked the Lord, is this against me, against my marriage, against my family, against our ministry? What is the sinister plot against? Now, February 13th, when I woke up that morning, I was not thinking COVID. We hadn't had a COVID death until the third week of March. So COVID was not on the radar in the national news at that time, February 13th. You know what was on my radar? Did I forget Valentine's Day? <laughs> Why? Because that was very personal and very immediate. So I'm thinking, what happened? Did, did I miss this? I, I'm dead. You know, it's that feeling that you, you forgot a birthday or for, did, did I, you know. Well, by, by March 1st of 20, the Lord laid it out for me. And he showed me that the sinister plot is from the enemy, taken from, he, he, he took me to a scripture. You know, the Lord will not only talk to you um, by the Spirit, he'll talk to you through the Word. And let me, let me say this real quick. Just, I'm not selling Bibles out there. But God sent his word to communicate to us primarily. He created us spirit beings just like him as compatible beings to communicate with us. But those two have to agree. Because other spirits can talk to your spirit too. So the word, the word, the Bible says, let every word be, a, be established by two or three. That's one thing, one reason that we were very close to Brother Hagin since 1969. The first, the first month my brother and I were, were born again, we were born again three weeks apart. The first month we were born again, we got connected to Brother Hagin. Back then a Hagin meeting, if you had, if you had 100 people, that's a big Hagin meeting. So we go way, way back in those days. We had a lot of private time with Brother Hagen and, and different ones. And uh, the pastor that we were serving was our uncle. Pastor Colby's met him. Well, he and Brother Copeland were doing Brother Hagen's altar calls. And my brother and I were the catchers in the prayer line. We were also the gophers in the prayer room because... At each of those meetings, Brother Hagen would, would have, and all these different ministers would come and different people would come. That, again, these are not big arena meetings like they became. They were, these were much smaller meetings, rooms like this and smaller. I was in a holodome one time in Midland, Texas, and there were only 30 people at a Hagen meeting. And 10 of them were his worship team, Faith Creation. So... Um, that predates Raymond Singers and Band. So we got very connected personally. So we were the gophers. So we would run out to the book table and get new birth books and white tongues books and, and, and give to those people in the, in the prayer room, et cetera, et cetera. My uncle and brother Copeland would flip flop one, one night. One of them would do um, salvation. The other one would do uh, Holy Spirit. And then they would flip-flop the next night. So we go way back with those, those days. I know I don't look a day over 40, but, but I've been in the ministry 45 years. So, so what, what I want you to see is 
we cut our teeth on the word and a, a minister that was very pro-local church and we were very much pro-local church still am but we we have these ministers today that you know what you really need to be you really need to be tied into this prophet's ministry and this apostle's ministry and you need to be tied into the word just like pastor Kobe was saying and if it's not in the word run the other way amen see the word's not sexy to a lot of people it, it doesn't draw a, a, a lot of huge crowds most of the time what people run to most of the time is the candy. There's some of these prophets out there today, they're talking about, you know, that one particular female so-called prophet, she talks about she spends more time in heaven than she does on earth. What, what scripture is that? Right. Exactly. And then she sees different things in heaven like, Cows driving tractors. You know, I've seen a lot of cows around tractors, but I've never seen one behind the wheel of a tractor. What spiritual significance is there with a cow driving a tractor? Now, God made cows. Skim milk. Skim milk. <laughs> and that the mountains in heaven are made of jello. You know, I really like Jello, but I, I just, I just don't believe that's God's taste. Is it sugar-free Jello? Uh, you know what? And what flavor is it? And that the rivers are made out of pudding. You know that sounds really good, but you probably have a sweet tooth, and that's probably why you you came back from heaven supposedly, and you believe that. And people suck this trash up. Why? Because they're not. The, they're not people of the word. Because you won't find any of that. You won't find any of that in the word. I mean, revelation is bizarre enough. So why are you making the word more bizarre? Why are you making things more bizarre? And Brother Hagin taught us something extremely significant. And he said these words, his whole ministry. Most people are running to the spectacular and they miss the supernatural. This is not bizarro world. The word can stand up to scrutiny. All this other stuff cannot, but the word can stand up to scrutiny. You don't have to check your brain at the door at Victory Life Church. You don't have to, there, there, there's, you know, there's a coat rack, but there's not a brain rack anywhere. So bring it on in. Because the word can stand, stand scrutiny. Amen. And, and, and most, most people, it's, it's just not spectacular enough. And, and, and I know they get on television, but I have a question for you. Do you have to have the truth to get on Christian TV or radio? Do you have to have the truth to, to write a Christian book? No, no, no. It's crazy. And again, one of, the, one of the problems with being in the ministry so many years, you see this stuff recycle. You see this stuff return, and, it, and it's all kinds of craziness. Why do you think that is? And this is, this is really my topic. Why do you think... This stuff repeats itself over and over. Why do, you, why do you think it ever gets traction? Because the enemy is behind it, and he's trying to distract you from the word because he fears those who know the word. Because the word is based on authority from the Lord Jesus Christ because the word is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants to get you away from the word. What does it say? When you hear the word, Satan, Jesus said this, immediately he comes to steal the word. Why? Because the word has authority. The word is your authority. Come on. The word is your authority. And that is my topic. And really, that's Tim's topic too. We're, we're you know, we're, 
operating all around it. But that, that's really our topic. And that's really, that's really what our kind of churches and our kind of ministries are about. So I began looking at the sinister plot. The Lord gave me the scripture in Corinthians that says, we being not ignorant of Satan's devices. And I looked it up in a Greek dictionary and I saw the word sinister. And I said, okay, is this against me, our ministry, our marriage, our family? And he said, it's against the church, number one. And again, I'm not even thinking COVID. It's against the church. Now, I posted this on social media at the time. There were three things he said it was against, but I'm going to focus on the church. 3-1-2020, there were 256,000 churches in the United States of America. Jesus preaching churches. 256,000. That's a record. We've never had that many Jesus preaching churches. In two years, March 1st, 2020, it was reduced to 155,000. We lost 101,000 New Testament churches in 2020 and 2021. Unprecedented. Now do the math. If they only average 10 people at church, that's still a lot of people. But it was more than an average of 10 people. The average was over 100 at another zero. Think about that now. Millions of people no longer in the church, no longer had a Jesus preaching church. We're not talking about Catholic churches. We're not talking about liturgical churches. We're not talking about Lutherans. We're not talking about, we're talking about churches that preach Jesus. So again, I did post this on social media at the time. And a lot of my posts, because they're from God, they get attacked but they can stand the scrutiny. So formidable faith. What is formidable faith? It's Bible faith. It's the God kind of faith. Because the word formidable means tough. It means powerful. It means straightforward. It means it can stand up to the muster. Whatever. Whatever. Somebody over here like to have this? Anybody? All right. If you snooze, you lose. This is taught directly to, to dads, to husbands, faith, fathers, and family. How, how can I have the right kind of faith as a father for my family? Somebody over here? Thank you, sir. All right. Psalm 127.1 is our, is our text. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. It's the same as it was yesterday morning, but perhaps some of you weren't here. But I want you to refocus on what I said yesterday. God's a master builder. He is the master builder of the universe. Think about that. But what does that word build mean? It doesn't mean just construct and establish, create. It also means in Hebrew, rebuild. You can look it up in the Hebrew dictionary. It says rebuild. So God may not have been on your original construction of your house, your family, your, your personal life. But he will help you rebuild your life. Because God is not just a builder, master builder. He's a rebuilder. And God just doesn't repaint your edifice. He'll rebuild it. Big difference. He's not just going to scab something. He's going to build. And he's going to build it right. 
you know, if you have much construction experience and knowledge at all, you know that once you lay the foundation of something, you build a building on top of it. Um, it's very difficult to go back into the foundation and do anything with it. You know, when I, I first moved from West Texas to Tulsa, Jerusalem, started seeing all these ads on television and billboards, these foundation repair. And there's like 150 or 200 foundation repair companies in Tulsa. And I'm thinking, man, what is, it, what is this about? And I began to, I helped build the, ch build the church that I was serving, serving under. We bought 52 acres and built a building that held uh, 1,500 people and a and, uh, beautiful new building. But our biggest problem was the foundation because the moving rock, the bedrock is so deep that it's difficult to tie to the bedrock. But there's all kinds of large limestone rock in the ground. And so when you excavate, let me just say it this way, in that 52 acres, we had to make a 10-acre stormwater retention pond. Our excavation charges were almost a million dollars because of that limestone rock. Limestone, you can't build anything on limestone. It's too soft. But it makes a mess. You, and, and when you're digging and moving dirt and trying to build a foundation, you're going to run into all this limestone. And we were one of the highest uh, pieces of property in Tulsa County. And so my, my argument with the, with the city was, why do we need a stormwater detention pond when we're at, the, we're at the very highest place of the county? They said, because we need to stop the st stem the flow of the water as it moves downstream. I built a six-foot-wide <laughs> drainage from one side of our property, the highest side of our property, to the lowest side of our property, per their instruction, six foot wide trench, concrete trench, at the bottom of that stormwater retention. We had to build a road across it. That means we built a bridge, a dike, with a big, huge concrete culvert, taller than this room. Expense that was totally unnecessary. The largest amount of water that ever ran down through that trough was two feet wide. Because we're at the top of, we're at the, top of, the, of, of the county. And never has there been any standing water in that pond. Five acres over here, the dike runs through the middle of it. Five acres over here, there's never been any water there. We spent al almost a million dollars for nothing. But it, because they're bureaucrats, better not get me started. They're not elected. They're bureaucrats. If you think that's bad, have you been to Washington, D.C.? Have you actually b driven around the district? Mm. Anyway, you ought to thank God for, for a born-again governor and a conservative governor. But... We're grateful for ours in Texas. And, and Oklahoma now has a great spirit-filled governor that's pretty remarkable and is doing great things. Of course, the left, they don't, they don't like him at all. But my point in saying that is that rock is so oppressive, it affects everything you do. That rock is useless. When Jesus said, build your house on the rock and not the sand, he's not talking about limestone. He wasn't talking about Capernaum, like we are talking yesterday. When Jesus said in Matthew 16, upon this rock will I build my church, he's talking about the rock of revelation of the word. He's not talking about Peter. The Catholics believe he was talking about Peter, and they made him the first pope, and they have Peter's bones in the center of the Vatican. 
underneath the foundation. Now, Peter didn't run for Pope. <laughs> There's no black smoke, no white smoke coming out of the chimney. He was not voted in. And I'm pretty sure if Jesus were going to build his church on a disciple, it probably wouldn't have been Peter. He was too erratic. Huh? Come on. No, he's not going to build, he's not going to build his church on a personality. He's going to build his church on the, something stable, something strong. Come on, somebody. So that's what we must build our lives on, the rock of revelation of the word of God. And where does that, where does it go? How does that, how does that function? What is it, what is it really saying simply? You build your whole life on the word. On the stability, the strength, the power, and the authority of the word. Nothing else. Not on personality, not on giftings. Come on, somebody. Not on some prophet's word over you. Now, I, I believe in New Testament prophets. Don't misunderstand me. But I, I'm not, I'm not going to receive from the jello prophets or the pudding prophets. The tractor driving... The tractor driving cattle. Been around cattle my whole life. I've never seen one behind the wheel of a tractor. It's just, it's just crazy. But anyway, you know, the word has some bizarre things and bizarre stories in it. But they're all believable because they're true. And there, there's proof. And it's not just one random scripture. Come on. And what happens is many people, they want to cherry pick a scripture or two and try to make it stand on its own when they are not even speaking in proper context. Okay. This is not a hermeneutics class. But except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So, the word is about authority. The first place we learn of authority is the home. The second place is the church. In other words, spiritual authority, the church. Governmental authority is a, a different issue. But God could not just speak authority into existence. He had to create avenues by which his authority could operate and function. That's why he created the home. So the enemy... Just like we quoted yesterday, John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill, not or, and to kill and to destroy. So how does he do that? He can't just take you out anytime he wants. He can't just snuff your life out because you're God's creation. So what does he do? He has to come through legal channels because he has no authority of his own. If he had authority of his own, You'd already be snuffed out. You'd already be toast. It'd already be over. You'd already be a crispy critter burning in hell. Because he would have taken you out. But he doesn't have authority. Jesus said in Matthew 28, I'm just rehearsing some of the things I shared yesterday. In Matthew 28, all authority, it says power in the King James, there's a Greek word exousia, which means authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto you. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to show you something. Philippians chapter 2. This, this will help you understand what he's communicating. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians right after, right after Ephesians. Between Colossians and Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2. You see the context of this. It says, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, 
He humbled himself. That'd be a good thing to do. And become obedient, became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now I want you to mark out that, that word, that letter A, because in the original text, it doesn't say a name. It says the name. Put the word the there. He has given him the name. Say the name. the name. When we pray, we're supposed to pray in the name of Jesus. Not a name Jesus. The name of Jesus. Now why is that significant? Singular. He's the only one with that name. It's the name of Jesus. Paul talks later about at that name. That name. Not a name. That name. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Jesus as Lord. He's the only one that's Lord. Hello? Hello? Nobody else is Lord. So at that name, he has given him the name. The name. Which is above every name. You know, names are important. Amen. That at the name, see there, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. On and on. But this is what I want you to see. That name has authority for you, for me, in three realms. Heaven, earth, and beneath the earth. You and I have the power, the right, the authority. We've been delegated that authority by the Lord Jesus himself, by the word of God, to use that name that has power and authority in the heavens now think, think through this now. Don't, when, when you read the word heaven or heavens in the New Testament, don't think third heaven. Most of the time, it's not talking about the third heaven where God resides. It's talking about the heavenlies, the dark places, the sky. Come on, somebody. Where the spiritual warfare is taking place. You don't need the name of Jesus when you get to heaven. That's your destination. That's our destination because we've lived under the lordship of that name here on the dirt ball. When, when John, the only first Baptist... made his appearance, he never said, look at me, look at what I'm doing. He said, he that comes after me is far greater, mightier than mine. Whose shoes I'm not even worthy to bear. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. And he's going to come Holy Ghost and fire. I indeed baptize you with water under penance, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Come on, that's Matthew 3, right there at the beginning of Matthew, New Testament. He's going to come and he's going to bring Holy Ghost and fire. He's going to bring you authority. Come on. So what was John, the only first Baptist message, his only message? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I love what Tim contrasted kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God. 
It's accurate. Most people confuse them. Kingdom of God is all-encompassing. Kingdom of heaven is being very specific, but it's not capital H. It's not the third heaven. It's talking about the heavenlies. Paul went into great detail in Corinthians and, and beyond. Ephesians and Galatians went into great detail about our authority in the heavens, especially Ephesians chapter 6, where he talked about we need to put on the whole armor of God. We may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil in the evil day, the wiles of the devil, the strategies and tricks of deceit of the devil. He has lots of strategies and tricks of deceit, and we need to have the armor of God on. What does that mean? Don't fight naked. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't fight naked. We've all had those dreams, right? That we showed up at work naked, showed up at school naked, whatever. But don't ever show up a fight with it in a spiritual fight naked. Put your armor on. Amen. There's no armor for your butt, so just let them see your butt. But, do you, you, you know, it's after you've already run over them. I know it's a little early for being so graphic, but anyway. Word pictures. But my point is this. We get all caught up in all this stuff. Why? Because, well, they said this on Christian TV and on Christian radio I heard this and this Christian book I read this. You can get so messed up by watching Christian TV all day, listen to Christian radio all day. Do I, 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 I've been on TV. I've been on radio. I've written all kinds of manuals and, and, and books over the years. But you know what? In articles, but if it's not the word, throw it out. Get rid of it. Well, so-and-so, they had this experience, and I just wanted to hear about this experience. If it's not word-based, throw it away. Get it out of your life. I mean, is it Jell-O pudding, or is it, is it, you know, what brand is it? Doesn't matter. It's silliness. What was John, the only first Baptist, telling us? The same thing that Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 4. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus plagiarized John the Baptist. He copied John the Baptist. But who were they really copying? The Holy Spirit's voice. It's time for you to change. Repent means turn. It means to change your mind, change your thinking. The way you've been serving God to date will no longer work. What you must do is get out of the works of the law and start walking by faith. Come on. And therefore, you will be able to exercise your authority in the heavens and the earth and beneath the earth, in the name, the name, the name, the name of Jesus. That's why the devil opposed him so. That's also why the religious people of the day opposed him so. Because he upset their little apple cart. Because they had a pretty good gig going. They had great authority and power in the known church world at the time. And now this guy's going to come and heal on the Sabbath? Who is he to tell the man that his sins are forgiven? He's deity. That's who he is. So let's get back to what this is saying to us. That at the name of Jesus, verse 10, every knee should bow. It says, of the things in heaven, things is italicized, meaning it was not in the original version. And things in earth, or of heaven, of earth, and under the earth. Not just things, but of heaven, of earth, and of under the earth. 
We have to understand what's taking place. So what is the devil attacking? He's attacking. It's not personal. Even though we are creations of God, created in the image and likeness of God, it's not a personal attack against you. It's an attack against the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. And he can only come through the channels of authority that God created. The devil just can't randomly attack you. He has to operate and function within the vehicles of authority that Jesus created. That's why he's attacking the home. That's why he's trying to redefine the home, redefine marriage, redefine gender. They tell us there's 52 genders now. Some say that there's 82, 92. Talk about confusion. Every person, every person that's non-binary came from a man and a woman, I said yesterday. There's no debate on that. And that ought to be one of your first questions. If they say they're non-binary, ask them, where did you come from? Which two mamas did you come from? Which two daddies did you come from? Come, just ask them a simple question like that. But they usually won't debate you. They just call you a racist, a white supremacist, a hater. Don't they? Why? Because they can't debate you. Why? Because they have no truth. And so what are we doing as the church hiding? Now don't misunderstand me. We're to never go look for a fight. But when the fight comes, we need to stand up to the fight and show the devil where, where he is and expose him for what he is. He is a liar. Like I said yesterday, the first sin in the garden was not Adam's rebellion. It was the lie of Satan. You will not surely die, as God said. You won't die, Eve, when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You won't die. That's the first sin. He, that's why he's called the father of lies. He told the first lie on earth. And there it is, right there in Genesis chapter 3, right there before our very eyes. And many people just they overlook that. He's still telling lies. And Adam had the authority that God gave him in Genesis chapter 1 to subdue, to dress, to keep the garden. Come on. God gave him that authority. He was the first G little G-O-D of, of this dirt ball. God gave Adam that authority to dress, to keep, and subdue, to take dominion over everything in the garden, right? He gave him the authority. And then what happens? This gorgeous creation shows up, and he lost his mind. And that's why the devil uses beauty, something good, to tempt you. Something God created to tempt you. Remember, he used something good. The fruit was good. Fruit was not evil. The fruit was not perverted. It was a creation of God. He used something good to tempt Adam and Eve. The devil still uses good things that God ordained for good to tempt us. That's a whole different seminar. But we have to know who we are in Christ. We have to realize that when we're tempted, it's always evil. The temptation itself is not necessarily evil, but the I'm talking about the, the, the person or whatever. Money is not evil. Money takes on the characteristic of its possess possessor. So money in itself is not evil. It's just a tool. 
It's what people do with it that make it evil or not. So it's important to see that the enemy tempts us with different things, and they can be good. They don't have to be evil. You know, sometimes you're tempted with truth to tell the truth in a situation. But maybe God doesn't want you to tell the truth in the manner that you're tempted to tell the truth. Right? Like somebody standing up here in public and you shout out, you ugly. It may be true. But you don't need to be tempted to say, you don't need to be tempted, you don't need to fall, fall, follow that temptation to say that. <laughs> don't look around when I said ugly, don't look around. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So everything that the enemy uses to tempt you is not necessarily evil. It's the temptation, it's following his lead that's the evil part. But the devil never tells the truth. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. He twists things. He perverts things. He's not a creator. He's a perverter. So he never, he never had a thing to do with creating the home, creating the church, or even creating government. He perverts what God has ordained for authority to operate in our lives. And so what is he doing? He's trying to pervert home, pervert man, pervert woman, for what purpose? To distract you from the very thing that's going to bring victory in your life. The Bible says one can put a thousand in flight, two can put ten thousand in flight. When you marry, gentlemen, when you marry young men, when you marry a godly woman, you have spiritual strength and authority that's not twice as strong, but ten times the power, 10 times the authority. Amen. That's why the devil is attacking homes and families because families have the potential to run the devil out of their lives. Now, whether or not they're doing it is a whole different issue. Now, I've got to, I've got to hurry and close. But it's critical that we see how the enemy operates in these areas. He's trying to subvert godly authority in the earth. And here's, the, here's my pet peeve. Sometimes unbelievers do a better job at standing up to the stupidity than believers do. And it ought not be that way. I used the scripture yesterday, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. That word vision is not talking about eyesight because we know people that have been blind, they didn't, they didn't perish. It's talking about redemptive revelation. What is revelation? It's a picture of the future. Not Pastor Tim said yesterday, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, Peter. But my Father which is in heaven revealed that to you. So that came by revelation. It came by a picture from God. A vision from God. Here's what I want you to see about Matthew 16. Peter was the first one in the New Testament said, that said, You're him! We've sung about you our whole lives. We've learned about you. We have feasts and we have celebrations about you that point to you and you're him. Right. If he said that in the temple, he would have been taken out in the, in the courtyard and stoned. He's the first one that publicly said, you're him. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the Messiah. Think about it. That's very significant. We read right through that. Well, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That sounds real spiritual. Until you realize you put yourself in his shoes for the first time in the New Testament. The first time in history, somebody that said, you're the guy. And that's when Jesus responded and said, blessed are Art thou son of Simon? 
because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But my Father, vision is redemptive revelation. It's a picture of redemption. But what does that vision, what does it entail? It's a picture of your redemption. Redemption of who you've been made to be. A a revelation of who you are. That was wonderful for Peter to say and have a revelation of who Jesus is. But just like Tim said yesterday, even the devil knows who Jesus is. Every demon knows who Jesus is. So that's not as big a deal. What the devil is trying to do by attacking this authority in your life is so you'll never discover who you are in Christ. Those 256,000 churches, now 155,000 churches, they all know that Jesus is the Christ. But I promise you, most of those people, of the millions of people, most of them don't know who they are in Christ. Therefore, they're not walking in spiritual authority. And that is the biggest indictment against the New Testament church. Jesus took his disciples on a boat ride to go across the Sea of Galilee, Mark 4, some other places too. But he said, we're going to the other side. He didn't say, let us pass over to the other side. Jews don't talk like that. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Get in the boat, let's go. His statement, we're going to the other side, was all they needed to get to the other side. It was his word. We're going. He didn't say, let's pray about our boat ride. Well, he knew that there was a storm coming. Where's the proof of he knew that there was a storm coming? Remember, he was, he was a man. The things he knew were of the spirit. But he was wiped out. He was tired. He went to sleep in the hinder part of the ship. And he woke up, not to one disciple, not to Peter, James, and John, three disciples who were closest to him. All 12 disciples woke him up. Why? Because they are greatly in fear. King James says, Master, carest thou not that we perish? You really think Jews talk like that? Have you ever been to the Middle East, anywhere around the Mediterranean, and you think those people talk like that? No. They're talking about the weather, and you think they're in a fight. They're using their hands. They're waving. They're loud. Have you ever had a conversation with an Italian or a Greek, a Turk? They are so loud and demonstrative. What were they really saying? Jesus, we're dying here. What are you doing asleep? You got us in this boat. You're going to kill us. Don't you love us? That's what the word care means. Don't you love us? How do you know this? Because they were tormented with fear. Because they had no love. Perfect love casts out all fear. If they were in love with the word, they would have not have been fearful. If Christians in 2020 were in love with the word, they would not have been fearful. But they were consumed with fear. And many in the church still are. Don't you love us? What did Jesus do? He immediately arose and he rebuked the wind and he said, key statement here, authority always uses its voice. 
That's why the devil has twisted people's minds in the church to be quiet. Be quiet. You reverend. Quiet. No, authority uses its voice. Huh? The devil wants you to shut up. Jesus wants you to lift up the name loudly. He spoke to the wind and the waves, and they stopped. But he wasn't finished rebuking. He now turned to his disciples, and he said, Why are you so fearful? The God's Word translation says, Why are you such cowards? What would he say to the church of 2020? If he said that to disciples... And then he said, how is it you that have no faith? God's word translation says, GWT says, how do you not have faith yet? Now, I give the disciples a pass. It was just Mark 4. They weren't very long into this following of this guy. These guys didn't have a Bible. These guys are not even born again. They're not spirit-filled. What's your excuse You got a Bible or 10. You got the voice of the Holy Spirit. You got all these examples of great men and women of God that have gone before us, and we're still filled with fear. We're still not using our voice to tell the devil where tell the devil where to get off. This is stronger men's conference, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not pussyfooter. Right. Yeah. Not panty waist men's conference. But yet, we got a lot of panty waist in the church today. And they've outsourced, men have outsourced their spiritual authority to their wives. Mm. They've outsourced their fatherhood to the school systems. Or the state, even worse. Or even to the church, the children's minister, or the youth pastor. We're supposed to be men of God. Men of the word. Not men of wokeness. Not weenie-fied men. We've got all kinds of different words in West Texas that I can't use here. <laughs> but it's time for men of the church to rise up and be the men of God. Amen. And men of honor that he's created us to be. And that he's, he's molded and he's shown us and he's taught us and he's modeled others in front of us. And we're still like, Pastor, please pray for me. The devil's been attacking me all month. Take off your pampers and put on your big boy britches. Get into the word of God and you'll never make a stupid statement like that ever again. Let me tell you something. My pastor is Pastor Hagen. If I went up to Pastor Hagen and said, pray for me, Pastor. I'm really having a tough time. He would slap me around. You're from Texas, boy. Pastor Colby's met my uncle, who was my first pastor, connected to Brother Hagen. If he heard me even think like that, if I ever uttered a thought like that, he, he, he grabbed me by the ears, because I remember that as a boy, he grabbed me by the ears. He could take me wherever he needed me to go by grabbing me by the ears. But see, what are we doing? Most men today are running to a path of least resistance. They're going to a, a so-called church, but it, they don't really call them churches anymore. It, it's a community. It's a community. You know, after all, Jesus said, upon this rock will I build my community. No, it's a church. Yeah. A New Testament. Bible-believing. 
devil honey kicking local church he doesn't want you to go to that church because he's after your authority he's after your authority it's time for us to stand up and be counted for men of God and men of honor let's pray father I pray for these men today that they've heard anything in these last two days I pray, Lord, that they've heard the last 15 minutes. That they would stand up and be counted. And they would become the men of God, the men of love, the men of authority that you've created them to be. That you've modeled for them to live. We have examples. We have real men in our Bibles that did it the right way. And Lord, we bless you and we thank you for the word. We thank you for who we are and who you've made us to be in Christ. And Lord, I pray above all things that these men will discover who you've made them to be, that they would walk in the redemptive revelation of who they are in Jesus Christ in these last days. And I pray, God, that when they wake up, and they see that reality. When they get out of bed in the morning, the devil pees in his pants. In Jesus' name, amen. And you've never heard a prayer like that before. Amen.